There's online webisodes and all sorts of opportunities that all of that needs music. And many of those want music that sound like it's from an artist as opposed to a pre-recorded library. So there's a number of opportunities to get your music out there. All the shows, um, films have music supervisors. That's a career I didn't even know about until not that long ago. Um, these are people whose job it is to find the songs, to put in the commercials, to put in the films, to put in the television shows. You want to get to know them, you want to go to where they are, you want to send them your music and say, you know, here it is if you have a use for it. Um, so you have to do your own groundwork, um, all with the foundation of having done the, the legal work up front. But um, many an artist made a mistake of thinking, I've got signed, I've you know, made my uh, CD, it's coming out next week, and it came out next week, and then it crashed, never to be seen again. At which point, then, if you're relying on the label to take care of it for you, they're moving on to the next thing. They've cut their losses, and they're moving on to those other 99 artists they signed. Um, but you're about you all day long, so you can be doing the groundwork, um, offer your music to be used, you know, uh, in a, a nonprofit might have a website and they may need, you know, some music for that. Just different places that you want exposure, you want people to become aware of your music, to understand that they like it and like you as an artist and want to come see you and pay to see you. Um, and once you build that kind of relationship, I've heard of crazy situations where uh, folks will, again, this was with CDs, but they would, well, it doesn't have to be a CD, it could be just, you know, 10 songs and you offer, you know, here's X amount, it, well, no, you can have the 10 songs for free. For $50, you get the music and I'll send you this t-shirt. For X amount, you can go all the way up to some ridiculous amount where somebody's willing to pay $10,000 to have you come and perform in their living room for their anniversary or birthday party or whatever, because the value's in you, not the, mu the music, as somebody said earlier, was just like a commercial to get them connected to you. But once they value you as an artist, then they're willing to pay, somebody's willing to pay a lot to have you come perform at their corporate event, uh, or again, house exclusive house party or those sorts of things. So it's about really looking at, uh, you mentioned multiple streams of revenue, um, you know, they're, those are the ones that are out there, and you have the power and the responsibility to do the hard work to make it happen. Okay. I, I kind of connected with something that um, I wanted to ask Mr. Watkins to explain. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk about um, there was a lot of lines that came through, but you said you didn't have some free. Uh -huh. Could you just explain a little bit about that or share an experience? Okay, I'll share an experience with my first, my first production was with Glenn Jones. Um, he paid me $2,500 to play on a song he wrote. He did not give me credit for the song. I wound up producing five songs on that album called Here I Go Again. Well, guess what? My song went to number one. That one song got me a publishing deal with Warner Chapel Records for a half million dollars, that one song. There were other uh, uh, producers that he wanted on his, on his CD, and they didn't think there was enough money, but they never had a record out. But they thought their record was better than what the amount of money he was offering and the publishing. So he took one of my songs that I should have gotten publishing for, but that one song, Got me a half a million dollar publishing deal. Okay, let me let me break that down to you. A record company or a publishing company, well, let me go back. If you get something that pops, people will find you. You don't gotta go look for nobody. If you got something that's hot, I promise you, you you will be amazed. Like, oh my God, how did they find me? <laughs> Am I really talking to the president of... <laughs> and let me tell you this, if you black and you start making too much money on the, on the, on the low end, the white folks gonna get in on it. <laughs> they not gonna let you make all that money by yourself. They gonna find you, they gonna cut a deal with you. 
So a publishing deal and a record deal is nothing but a glorified loan. That's all it is. They loaning you some money because you don't got the money to fund what you're trying to do independently. You follow me? So here we go. The more money you take, the more points they take. The less money you take, the more money you get to make. The sooner you can pay off your loan. That's how it goes. All right? So here I go. I'm, I'm with Motown Records. I'm going to give you $350,000 to do your record. I'm going to give you a $75,000 bonus. Where are we at right now? You got to pay that $425,000 back before you see another dime. So that $75,000, you better spend it wisely. But no, you're going to go get the car. You're going to go get some new gear. And a chain. And a chain. And guess what? You already broke. And your album, you ain't even got three songs on your album yet. No, you cannot get that $350,000 is for producers like me. Which we still gonna give. So watch this. So now you up to four twenty five. Yep. You need a video, don't you? Huh? A couple videos. Oh, so now we at our uh, average video today is. It can vary. A half a million dollars. How about that? That's a whole nother panel. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Where you at now? Nine twenty five. Now. Your record is popping, right? It's in Japan, it's in Switzerland, you hear it on the radio, you popping, but you ain't got no money. Cause you owe them $925,000 and they gonna get their money before you get your money. They not in here, and plus they gotta make some money. They not giving up a million dollars for you, for them not to make no money. So now you mad. You on, you on tour. You popping. Everybody is waving and hollering and screaming at you. And you got $5 in your pocket. That's the reality of it. That's why people go independent. And just to, just to add a little bit more insult to what he just said. Um, starting back in... Uh, around 2008, 2009, the record labels, uh, the business model was changing. So what they said is, hey man, we, we're not making money on record sales anymore. What are we, we going to do? And then they came up with this thing called an all rights deal. Right. Or they came up with this thing called a 360 deal where traditionally a record label couldn't dip their hands into your touring. They couldn't dip their hands into your merch and they couldn't dip their hands into your publishing you know all of those ancillary streams of income that was yours but then the label said Ooh, uh, we gotta find a way to make money or we going out of business so then they came in and forced you to give up all of a percentage of all of these other income streams and so you look at it and that's why I say that Starting out, you've got all the leverage now. You do not need a record label, at least when you start out. And, and you look at the young guys, the way that they're doing it now, you look at Frank Ocean, you look at Chance the Rapper, and these, these are guys that say, I'm doing it my way. I, I'm gonna do it the way I wanna do it and screw all of you other people. And did you guys, get a chance to, do you know what happened with Frank Ocean last year? Does anybody know that story? You, you, need to, you need to go back and do some research and read about what Frank Ocean did because he was on Island Def Jam and he was pissed off at, at uh, the way that they had handled their business and he still owed them two albums. And tell them the minimum you can sign of uh, publishing. Oh, most publishing and record deals are seven years. Oh God. Of your life. That's an indentured servant. <laughs> but when you when you sign to them, they really don't even do it by years anymore. They do it by album cycles. 
So, and, and, and if you have a successful album, then that one album cycle could be three years because they don't want to put out another record because once that album goes out, you're on the road touring and promoting it. So, you know, before you put your second album out, it could be three years, you know, so, and then there's four options. So, again, you don't need the record labels. There is a time and place when you will need them. But if you want them and you actually need them, then that means you have a lot of leverage because what you need them for is their infrastructure and you need them for their expertise to be able to collect your money worldwide because the record labels have systems set up around the entire world. And if you are at the point where you need their services because you need someone to market your record in Germany or Switzerland or Africa or Japan or wherever, and you need someone to collect that money, then that means you've attained a lot of success. So instead of signing to a label, then you and your team will find a good fit for a partnership where you can go into a joint venture where they don't own anything you own everything and you say listen i'm interested in doing business with you because i need your back office support to help me collect this money and i need you to make sure that my releases are going well here or there but by the time you do that you have a lot of leverage and it's not a take it or leave it because they want to get in on that income stream too they see all of that money that's being made they're ready to sit down and wine and dine you but when they're whining and dining you you have to say, no, you're not whining and dining me. I'm whining and dining you because I'm going to do business on my terms. This is what I want. This is what I'm willing to give up. And if we can't do it, bye. See ya. I'll go over here to someone else. And that's what they don't want. They don't want that money that's out there because for them it's free and easy money because they already have the system, they already have the infrastructure set up around the world. So if they're able to bring you in as a partner, that's gravy for them. They don't have to go through the expense of setting it all up. So they have to keep partnering with people. And the, the record labels have had to change and they've had to adapt. So the record business over the past 20 years has gone through major changes. And, and right now, we are in the wild, wild west of the entertainment business. And the reason I say that is because there are no standards anymore. There's no standard contracts. There's no standard marketing plans. Uh, there's no standard distribution plans. And you know what made that possible? It's what we're talking about, technology. Technology is changing so fast that what happened 10 years ago in the music business is almost obsolete now. What happened last year in the music business is changing so fast that next year it's gonna be different. So. It's changing so fast, which is why we go back to what we've all been saying up here, is that creativity is the name of the game. Creativity is you make your own rules. You don't care what anybody else says, oh, this is the way it's always been done. You're like, I don't care about how it's been done. This is what I'm going to do because I'm the one that created this. I own it. I control it. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. Protect yourself, but you can do it your way. And that's why I say you look around you and all of these creative people around you, guys, get with them. It's amazing. Technology, every new technological invention that is made need one thing. You know what it is? Content. Content is never going to go away. Music is never going to lose its importance. The way people have made money off of it in the past has changed. It's going to continue to change and it will forever change. But there is always going to be a need for music. There's, that's never going to change. It's always going to be in great demand. I just wanted to say one thing before Linda comes and grabs us. But just one thing that just occurred to me um, that's different uh, today than it was definitely 10 years ago is um, it's important to not just think of music in isolation 
Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I used to sit in my room, put on some headphones, and I had to listen to an album backward and forward um, while I'm sitting there. Now we consume music differently, and it's usually, it's oftentimes part of something else. So in the encouragement to network with the campus, don't just think of music. Find the video folks, because um, music is part of something else. Uh, maybe how your music gets discovered. So, um, yeah, video games, um, uh, VR is new now, and it's so new that uh, Sony PlayStation, some of the different platforms, are at the point where they are actually paying to get content because mm -hmm. next Christmas you're not going to buy their their new goggles and that whole thing if there's nothing to experience on it. So the video games, all those are, they're looking for content. So partner with those folks. There are people creating, and independent is kind of the, the, the watchword of the day. You can create your own video games now, your own movies, your own music. So get with those folks and uh, network um, because it's just, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And I know we need to wrap. There's a question in the back. So, so what's the truth about sampling? Oh boy. Is there like a Magic time or we should probably take that offline because yeah, well, that's a, a longer conversation. Um, real quick about sampling. You have to um, clear the sample with who owns the sample. And they can charge you uh, whatever they want to charge you. And that's up to them whether they want you to use it or not. And if you use it and you, and you don't clear it, they can take the entire record. That's how that goes. But I'm, last, my last words is know your craft. F learn everything you can. The problem with most people in the music industry is that they don't, they don't have enough knowledge. And that's why you get taken, because you don't have the knowledge. It's kind of like the world revolves around. It's kind of like we were slaves and then we were free. But what happened to the slaves once they got free? They were still slaves. They were still slaves because they didn't have, have no money. They didn't have, they was free, but they couldn't eat. They didn't have no clothes. They didn't have no land. So what did they have to do? Go back to them. Go back to them. That's the way to, I want you to look at the record company. Is you free, but you don't have the money to put your out, put your, do everything you want to do. So guess what they do? They put you back on the plantation. <laughs> don't take it. You don't have to. So know your craft. Go up north like the smart black people did. It's <laughs> <And> still. <laughs> very, very quick. I know it's not for us to go, but when it comes to um, infringing uh, on, like, uh, what's the wrong with the word? Plagiarism. Or, or whatever, music lyrics from someone else. Uh, the thing that Pharrell got into and all that, how how much of a song, or how many notes do you have to, three? That, there's no real scientific formula. Because if it was a cut and dry formula, everybody would know what to do. But yeah, the, the, the landscape is that you have people that sit around and read cases every day, all day long, and just sitting there trying to find a, a new way to say that you infringed on my copyright or that you stole from me. And so the, it's like you're in a game and the goalposts are constantly moving because you have these minds that all they want to do is sit around and find, oh, this is a creative way? We can get them for this. And no one has ever heard of it before. It was never infringement before. But now this mind who's trying to gain some favor with his senior partner in the law firm who the past six weeks has done nothing but sat there and gone through case law and come up with this new theory. And then all of a sudden it is changing the landscape of the entire music business because something that wasn't infringement yesterday all of a sudden is infringement now. And on that happy note. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
you got to share your contact information. Absolutely. So this is a great, great panel. Let's give them another <laughs> April Chandler coming up to talk about marketing your music, and we have a showcase, so don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break to transition to that, and you can network and talk to them. Invaluable. Thank these gentlemen so much. And we do have um, food, so if any of you are hungry, we've got some bag lunches, and um, you can take a restroom break right quick.
Okay, we're getting ready to start our music marketing session. So you all don't want to miss this. She is a definite guru in this area. So you're in for a treat. For sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're gonna get um, we're gonna get started on this session. I just want to do a brief introduction of this wonderful, wonderful lady. I have the pleasure of knowing April Chandler and HBK Media. She specializes in multimedia initiatives that connect products and brands with consumers through authentic experiences. Now, her company, an arm of her company is Habeca Music Incorporated, an award-winning entertainment and marketing firm that specializes in multimedia vehicles that connect customers and brands through sponsorship, activation, national and local advertising, lifestyle marketing, social and digital media, and mobile initiatives. She is a very knowledgeable, very experienced, very creative, Put your hands together, and we'll just welcome April Chandler. She's going to share with you about marketing your music. Thank you. Thank you. So how is everyone today? You having a good time so far? Yes, ma'am. All right. Can you see me up pretty good and hear me well? Yes, ma'am. Great, great. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for, um, thanks to Linda Greenwood for inviting me. It's an honor. And, uh, Okay, a couple of things. What I'd like to do first, I'm hearing a little um, feedback. Are you getting feedback? No, no. No, okay. All right, let's see. I'll turn, turn me down a little bit. Oh. Break it up a little bit. Okay. All right, how's that? Okay, good. Okay, great. So I want to give a little background about myself. I started a um, company for back to use in 2007. Prior to that, I worked at Capitol Records, I worked at uh, Time Warner, EMI, Motown, and um, recently, again, I started a label, Hapeka Music, with distribution through Universal Music. And I want to tell you guys, it does matter. Internships matter because, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was interning, uh, the vice president uh, who gave me my first deal, you know, was a uh, was a boss that I happened to uh, intern and we to each other, and they were actually looking to uh, at that time develop more music in the gospel uh, field, which is where I was at the time. Prior to going and working in gospel, I worked with Boys to Men uh, when they were. Did anybody see the new, uh, the new edition trilogy? Okay, so when Michael Bivens uh, met Boys to Men and signed them to the label, well, I was a part of the group that helped launch that Boys to Men brand. Um, I also worked with Butane Plant and uh, Fat Joe, so I did hip hop as well. But I want to give you a little, you guys a little bit of um, statistics. In 1999, the record business was at its peak. The industry was earning an all-time high of $15 billion a year. By 2004, uh, CD account CD accounted for 80% of sales. So that's 80% of the music that was sold was CD sales. Just four years later, the CD sales had plummeted more than 45%. So there was this great dive in music uh, that happened in just four short years. By 2012, CDs were only selling 11%. So it went from 80% at its peak to only 11% by 2012. And we're talking a short period of time. So a lot of the labels were caught off guard, didn't really understand what was happening in the industry. And so a lot of the marketing strategies were still being duplicated, but the sales just were not there. 
There were two factors that were also kept happening at the same time. Number one, consumers' value of music had shifted in terms of what they were willing to pay. So at the height, they were paying about $18 for a album. That's when you would see albums that you have 14, 15 tracks on them. Whereas right now, you may see an album with only 10 tracks. That's usually the norm. And now they're doing long form EPs, uh, which stands for electric, uh, Extended Play. They may only have about five uh, songs. So record sales went from, uh, CD sales went from like uh, uh, $80 to roughly now about $9 if you buy a physical CD at all. Um, so in addition to what consumers were willing to pay, another thing that was happening at that particular time that ladies were unaware of was Digital. It was like a, a nuisance, you know, with Napster. If you go back and do some of the research, uh, Napster was one of the first. It was created by kids, they, um, you know, in a garage. But it really did turn the music industry on its heels. So with that in mind, I started my label in 2007. I was still inside of the people. So. If in the midst of the decline, I had two choices, either to keep going or to just fold and, and go away. But like I said, I had been doing music for over uh, 20 years. Not 20 years at that time, but I, that was my career. That's how I ate. That's all I, I did. It wasn't anything that I did on the side of my time um, way of uh, making money. So, what was going on? Two things. There was the rise of the internet and the proliferation of mobile devices. So, with that said, I had to figure out how do I survive? How do I market my product? How do I maintain market share in the music industry? So, I developed what I call a five revenue stream strategy five revenue streams. So I would take every CD that I would release and make sure that the artist or the label, I mean, excuse me, the artist or the band would have whatever, could deliver on these five revenue streams. So for me, number one revenue stream was product sale. Uh, the fortunate thing about being in gospel music is that the church is still a base where we sell CD, so we can still, uh, you know, generate revenue there with these things. Another avenue that I had to make sure we uh, penetrated was in publishing revenue. So your publishing would come from BMI and ASCAP. Publishing is gener publishing generated publishing revenue is generated by radio airplay. So when you hear music on the radio, that is being tallied by either BMI or ASCAP. The radio stations then pay BMI and ASCAP. And then ASCAP will be impacted pay the list. So those are two revenue streams, the actual physical sales, uh, publishing revenue, and then streaming. Now streaming is paid mostly by sound exchange. I don't know if anybody covers sound exchange today, but that would come from internet radio stations. So when you have a uh, radio station that is on the internet, technically they should be paying sound exchange, some collection agency, the use of music. So that's number three. And then of course, for CD sales and merchandise, you see a lot of bands now uh, on site, they're selling CDs and uh, T-shirts and hoodies and keychains, all that, and then also you have to increase your tour date. So those are my four, my five revenue streams. That's the product sales, publishing, uh, digital through sound exchange, music and merchandise, and then finally your tour dates. So with that said, it's very important to do that. So. 
the way that I typically try to um, maximize is to focus on the area where the group, I feel like the group have a, a level of success. For instance, you're in North Carolina. It may be cost prohibitive for a band to try to cover the whole country, but perhaps they can carve out an area in between North and South Carolina. Say, I'm going to penetrate and maximize the city. I'm going to make sure that oh, I get on the local news. I make sure that I uh, send a, um, a kit to all clubs or uh, different venues that would uh, have a band in. Make sure that you can maximize the radio airplay in your area, those kinds of things. Because here's the thing. You can put your music up on iTunes, and you can put your music up on, you know, Spotify, and have people still need to know that you're there. You still have to uh, build a fan base. And of course, with the internet, you have a, a very large audience that you can tap into, but you still, even there, have to be able to get the attention to pull people into your area of influence. Let them know that, hey, this is, this. This is what I have going on. Um, what's the other one? SoundCloud does a very good job also being a platform. But then again, you can have the platform, but you still have to be able to find the market. How do I get somebody to listen? How do I, you know, um, you know, build my fan base? Any questions so far? No, it's good information though. Okay. So, um, one of the strategies for um, making sure that your product is viable is the, the, the design of the product. You know, when that customer, you want to make sure that your design is good. You want to evaluate it. You want to make sure that it is, um, it is marketable. I always say that the best tool is starting with a great photograph. You know, you may not necessarily want your your friend or your cousin, whatever, designing that particular product on the computer. You may want to make an investment, a chunk of investment, just to give you that edge, you know, that marketing edge. Because now, with uh, everyone being able to do whatever they want over the uh, computer, you have a lot of groups out there. You can tell who actually have a professional product and, and those don't. But you want to make sure that you figure out, okay, where do I 